Uh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, uh, you give to us the gift of Jesus, and that's why we're gathered here this morning. Uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit is also active here this morning. Um, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we know that when your children suffer in all kinds of ways that this uh, video just depicted, that that is not uh, according to your will. And you are calling uh, people, many of your followers from many, many different places across our country and even around the world, to be involved in ministries that truly are trying to end it. And even though there are 27 million uh, slaves these, in these days in all kinds of uh, horrible ways, we know that thousands of them are being delivered weekly and monthly and, and yearly. So we pray that you'll continue to bless the ministries that are doing this, that you will bless what's going on with the End It movement, and that you'd move some of our hearts and some of our souls uh, to remember uh, some of these brothers and sisters in our prayers. Uh, maybe it might even be that you're going to call some of us in this uh, church to um, uh, pursue that as a ministry. So Jesus, we're looking to you. Uh, again, these kind of things are very, very troubling to us. Uh, but yet we know that you are doing something. And one day, it truly will, uh, there will be an end to it. And we ask that you'd help us to be involved in some of that. Uh, we ask and pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, part of the reason that we show that to you this morning is that we have a young lady that's a senior in high school. Uh, Manny, would you, would you mind just standing up real, real quick? I don't want to embarrass you. But she's brought that to our church. And if a senior young lady in, our, in one of our high schools in the area brings this to the attention of our church, um, I think that's a good thing. And uh, yeah. <laughs> So again, um, just that you know, uh, one of the images that you saw with the light shining up, that was from Atlanta. Uh, that was from the Georgia Dome, if you're watching the NCAA championships. Back at the beginning of January this year, there were 45,000 uh, um, college-age students at, at um, what's called the Passion Movement, and that was their theme this year is to end it. A year ago, at the beginning of 2012, they were also in the Georgia Dome doing that same thing, and that was their theme. Uh, so there are thousands, literally thousands of people being delivered out of those kind of horrible hells um, over and over again, and we want you to be aware of that as a church. Um, that's a part of uh, what we want to be involved in is how can we end some of that in uh, justice and that. So um, let's get into today's message. We're actually going to spend the majority of the message time on just the title of today's message in the first line in your New Hope notes. So I know it's um, a little bit dark this uh, yet, and we'll maybe raise the lights up when we get to the, uh, our uh, message notes. But we're going to um, spend probably the first good 20 minutes on just the title, What Do I Believe In Really? What do I believe in really? And then this first line, um, what I really believe is what I really do. What I really believe is what I uh, really uh, do. So um, what we want to do with this board this morning is I hope to give a, sort of, um, a teaching that will move all of us. Again, it's moved me first, and I'm hoping and praying that will move you. I want to practice what we're going to put up here. And I'm also hoping that many of you will want to uh, practice it along uh, with me. Again, we would, I think we would all agree that one of the big uh, things that the Bible wants us all to get is this idea about um, salvation. I mean, uh, this is a, a key, key teaching of, of the Bible, this whole idea of, of uh, salvation. If you were with us uh, last week uh, for our Easter, uh, just a real quick um, thinking about that is that we kind of had this idea of uh, the th uh, three uh, gardens um, that we were talking about last week and just give it uh, another angle to it. Uh, we talked about the Garden of uh, Eden and that was this original garden that God had created. He put the first um, man and woman there, Adam and Eve, and it was an amazing garden, just delicious vegetables, delicious fruits. It was always, always uh, warm. But we know that we're no longer in this Garden of Eden, don't we? Especially for all of, those, of, of, the, of all of us who live in this area. When we woke up yesterday morning and saw that snow once again covered the ground, even though we knew it was going to melt by the end of the day, we realized we're no longer in the Garden of Eden. 
Um, so we live now in, this, uh, in the garden of this world, and we we're saying last week that um, all of us who live in this world, we live because of all these gardens, uh, gardens all over the world, uh, gardens around our nation, gardens that will be, some of will be planting uh, this, uh, this, this spring and into this summer. Um, we're looking forward to a few months from now, the apple harvest, harvest. Um, looking forward to cherry harvest, uh, all these things. So in this world, we know that we live because of all the gardens that are in, in, in the world. Now. But we also know that in this world that we live, there's this thing called death. There's no garden in this world producing some kind of super food that would keep us alive forever. And we, we know this. We experience this. We, know, we said last week, say it again this week, from last Easter to this Easter, even though we believe in the Easter story in that, there have been people that are near and dear to us in our lives that have died. Some have had um, children uh, die adult children, some have had uh, grandparents, some have had some, uh, we, we know we live in a world that even though there's all this life and we're living in it now, we know that this uh, world will not give us eternal salvation. So last week we were talking about the whole idea of here's this Easter garden that uh, Jesus on a fr good Friday, he's planted in a tomb in a garden. We made that connection last year, week through the Gospel of John. And so on Easter Sunday morning, he sprouted from the garden. He is alive now and he's given us this promise of this Easter garden and we know that there will always be life in that Easter garden. So this message of salvation is huge. We know we're no longer in the Garden of Eden. We live here, but we know that there's no garden that is going to keep us alive forever. But here's the promise. There is an Easter garden that Jesus can enter us in where salvation happens over and over again. We know that there's uh, one more circle that I need to draw this morning, but it's not a garden. Nothing lives here. There's just death upon death upon death upon death upon death. There won't be an end to it. This is the uh, place that we'd call uh, hell. Now we know that these realities exist from what the Bible tells us. So again, um, I want us to think about this morning that this idea of salvation that the Bible teaches is very important for us to get it right. Because there's times that we think, here's what I think the Bible teaches about salvation that could end up, get us to end up here. So what I want us to realize this morning is that this uh, salvation is a core teaching of the Bible. Now, this is something that we want to um, think about as deep as we can over and over again, uh, that this is a core teaching of the Bible. Uh, and we can hear a lot of very um, different ideas. Sometimes uh, people will have false teachings based on the, on the Bible. Uh, sometimes we have ideas that, you know, they're, just, they're, just, they're not in the Bible. We can say that they're in the Bible, but they're, they're not. And uh, again, the other thing that I want us to realize that this idea of salvation, the idea of the Bible, is all about um, this God as he presents himself to us as a father and as the father who wants us to have salvation, who has given us the Bible, he says yes when we get this core teaching of the Bible, right, the salvation, but we know we're no longer in Eden, we're in this world, but we're not uh, gonna be in this world for eternity, but there is Easter life. The Father says yes about that, and so does uh, Jesus. And the whole wonder of uh, Jesus as we were celebrating last week, as we celebrate this Sunday, as we celebrate every resurrection Sunday, every Sunday is a resurrection uh, Sunday, Jesus is saying yes to what he's done. And then uh, in this uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit, 
And we're going to look at this uh, next week uh, even more. But the Holy Spirit is saying yes too. Yes to what the Father wants. Yes to what the Jesus wants. Yes to, um, to, to the Easter garden of life. The Holy Spirit's doing things that are um, giving warmth to that, you know, this, this truth, giving warmth to that promise of Easter. He's, he's with us in this world to lead us from the, some of these uh, wrong ideas about salvation, some of the wrong ideas that we sometimes have uh, about the Bible. Now, the reason I want us to uh, think about this and I want to just separate this for a, a moment is that um, if I really uh, believe that this is um, the, the core teaching of the Bible about salvation, that the Father says yes, Jesus says yes, the Holy Spirit says yes, it, it's, it's going to, uh, um, I, I, will, I will follow the uh, what I really believe. It will help me to do what, I, what I'm uh, doing. Now, what I want us to look at is that I think there's a lot of people, and this is something that we all have to wrestle with, whether we're in the church or, or not, but there's a, a lot of people that um, they think salvation, they believe their salvation is going to happen in another way. And sometimes well, they will even uh, convince themselves that that's what the Bible uh, teaches. Now, here's how we're going to get at it. I want to draw a, a, a line here. And we're going to call this uh, a behavior line. And so uh, on this end of the behavior line, this would be kind of the what you could call the worst behavior. And over on this side would be uh, the best. So right here in the middle, we, we'd call that uh, average now, if I believe that my salvation is based on my good life and my good behaviors, here's what I will do. I will follow the examples of good behaviors. Now, again, we know that this is something that is, it just, it resonates with us. There's something in us that makes us want to think this is how salvation is going to happen. Now, if we were to do a sur survey uh, about, you know, what are some of your behaviors? What are some of your, you know, uh, good behaviors? Um, in most surveys, when that kind of thing is done among any kind of group of people, they're always above average. We get into this area that we would call uh, okay. Now, here's the deal when we think that salvation happens like this. If I'm here and this is how salvation happens, I'm going to be okay. And again, we, we have no problems putting ourselves in kind of that okay category. Because we look around this world and we know that there are behaviors that are worse than ours. And if we're honest, if we're real honest, we also look around the world and we know that there are behaviors that are better than ours, that are it's part of that best. And there's always that example in the spiritual world of, of a Billy Graham or of a Mother Teresa. We know in our honest moments, we are never going to be a Billy Graham or a Mother Teresa. We're not going to be the best. We know that there are people that exist that are better Bible scholars than us. We, we just know that. I know that. But if I believe that my salvation is here, that I'm going to be okay, if I believe that, then... I, I do things that will, uh, you know, we, we believe this and we, and we kind of do this with collective agreement. I mean, we, we know that if we have kind of good behaviors, they're going to be approved. They're going to be rewarded. They're going to be reinforced. We all have that. I mean, um, in, in our, our, it, you know, we, we learn it early on. If you do this, here's a reward. If you study hard, here's the grade. If you work hard, here's the money. If you do this, here's how your relationship will stay strong and solid. So we do all of those things. And um, kind of hear me carefully. The Bible is not against good behavior. But the Bible is against that good behavior will lead to your salvation. That is not the core teaching of the Bible. When, if you think that this good behavior, as long as you're okay, somewhere you know you're not the best, not that, if you look at that and think that's going to, you know, this is going to be your ticket, 
um, when it comes to this, if I believe that my, by my good behavior will lead to my salvation, the Bible says no, the Father says no, Jesus says no, and the Holy Spirit says no. So, and this is something that we, I think, really, really have to uh, uh, wrestle with. This kind of thinking can happen in the church. It happens in this church. It's happening in whatever church that you want to think of. Maybe that other churches that you, you, you know about. Again, there's a certain, as we get into this, there's a certain kind of, again, what we call a pile driving effect to this that I believe it I believe it I believe it because all these other people around me believe it all these other people reward me when I have this good behavior um here's here's the prime example when anyone dies even in the church you're going to hear someone say this he was a good man ah she was such a wonderful lady They say, they're saying that because they're saying their good behavior will now lead them to salvation. They led a good life. It's in a lot of our movies. It's, in, I mean, we just, we can't, we're just, it, it's a pile driving kind of thing. But it's not the core teaching of the Bible when it comes to salvation. It's not what the Father wants us, it's not what Jesus, it's, it's not what the, the Holy Spirit so again, if I really believe my salvation is based on my good life and my good behaviors, here's what I will do. It, it will affect how we, um, well, here's a really, uh, again, a, a, uh, do you notice today, if you were here last Easter Sunday at the 1030 service, that there weren't a lot of chairs open last week, were there? So a lot of people come to church on an Easter Sunday to just kind of be okay with God. Uh, again, there's a lot of people that as they came to Easter Sunday, um, probably this week they didn't really think about the Bible, didn't take any time to read it. Because if you really believe this, here's what you're going to do. You're just going to make sure that you're Okay. Some people read their Bible, some don't. I believe what's in the Bible. I believe that there is a God. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll be okay if I don't really produce a habit of going to, into one of God's churches on a regular basis. I'll be okay if I, you know, know that uh, Father Jesus, Holy Spirit, you know, I'll be okay as long as I know the Lord's prayer. So if I really believe that my good behavior is my salvation. Here are all the things that I will do. It's not the core teaching of the Bible. The Father says no to this. Jesus says no to this. The Holy Spirit says no to this. Not because they're opposed to good behavior, but because they are opposed that good behavior does not lead to the salvation, to what is the core teaching of the Bible, to what the Father will say yes to, to what Jesus will say yes to, and what the Holy Spirit will say uh, yes to. Now, let's look at this, and I'll just sure that we separate the, this, these two conflicting I ideas here. Here's, here's what the Bible teaches about salvation, what the core teaching of the Bible, what the Father is going to say yes to, what Jesus is going to say yes to, and what the Holy Spirit is going to say yes to, is that here is me, and here is Jesus. And salvation is realizing that this me right here, all of the me's that are in this room this morning, is that we are people that are infected with sin. And because we're infected with sin, even as we live really, really good lives in this world, we all know that we're going to die. We don't like to think about it, but, you know, we know it's a reality. So lots of times if we're over with this believing, I'm going to manage my sin. I'm going to, you know, not do the worst kind of sins. I may not, you know, make my, clean myself up all the way, but, again, I can manage my sin, and so I'll be okay. You know, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that this sin, the sin that's in me, the sin that's in me, some of these sins at times can be a, a, like a real, real cold, judgmental sin. 
again, how you know that that's uh, true of you, how I know it's true of me, is that sometimes when I'm, if I have this kind of thinking going on, um, if, I'm, if I'm okay, there's times that I really get a real cold, hard, judgmental against some of these people who are doing some of that worst stuff. Maybe just for a moment, there was something that stirred up in you as you were watching that indent movement that you would think that, man, I wish those men that did those kind of crimes, abused women, abused children like that, that God would just strike them dead. They belong in hell. We, we, just, we have that kind of thinking, but yet that, that, that sin that's in us, maybe some of these people could be led to a place of, they would be moved to a place of repentance. And then sometimes we also know that um, those that are maybe spiritually ahead of us is, what we, you know, if it's our good behavior, we don't like those people either. I mean, there's times in my life I've been really, really challenged about, here's this guy that reads seven languages. He knows his Greek and his Hebrew backwards. And I, I'm, I have a, enough time struggling, not slaughtering English like I was just trying to do right now. And so, so I don't like those people. So there's just this, this sin that's, that's in me. It can be cold, it can be hot. But then the whole idea with, with Jesus, what we're always saying is that there's just this warm presence of Jesus. I mean, that's what the Easter garden is all about. There's this warm presence of Jesus as he uh, comes back to life. I mean, there's, a, there's a, a truth to this. There's a life to it. We know that somehow there's a, all of God's strength is here with the, the wonder of who this uh, Jesus is. That as we realize that Jesus is the one that can lead us to this Easter garden, to this Easter life, that's salvation. That's the core teaching of the Bible. The Father says yes to this. Jesus obviously says yes to it. And the Holy Spirit says uh, yes to it. So what we need to be doing is always realizing that I have to look at me and my sin in a Jesus. This is the core teaching of the Bible. This is the core teaching of salvation. And whenever I look at me and my sin in Jesus, I need to be practicing repenting. As I keep practicing repenting, that leads to the wonder of salvation. Uh, again, there is nothing good in me why Jesus should have come and come near to me. But yet he still does. And he helps us to be practicing repenting so that we can go to him again and again and again. It's not about that I'm okay, here's worse sinners, here's better um, holy people than, than me. Um, th that's over here, as we get into this whole idea of uh, practicing repenting over and over again, daily, even daily, um, that we will start hearing the Father, yes, the Jesus, yes, and the Holy Spirit, yes we will start realizing that maybe we've got some misconceptions about the Bible over the years. We've come by them honestly. Sometimes even the church has help, helped us. Uh, sometimes many, many other Christians have, have helped us. It's, it's hard to get away from this. We'll, we'll slip back into this over and over again because it's a court. We've been, we've been doing some of these patterns for years and years. I mean, we just think about it. We just think about it. We just think about it. But it's not the core teaching of the Bible. The, the, the Father is, no, no. The, Jesus is, no, no. Why would he want to? I mean, there's a part when we start practicing repenting and and uh, in essence, we get good by it, we get um, good at doing it. It's not because we're good, it's because the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, yes. The Holy Spirit is saying, yes. The Holy Spirit is saying, yes. The Holy Spirit is saying, yes. You want to do this again. Think about your sin, and here's Jesus. Think about your sin, and here's Jesus. Think about your cold sin, here's the warmth of Jesus. Think about your hot sins, here's the warmth of Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's... Salvation, that's the core teaching of the Bible. That's where we're going to hear again the Father's yes and the yes of uh, Jesus and the yes of the Holy Spirit. What do I believe in really? Because what I really believe is what I really do. I believe my good behavior is going to get me to salvation. Why do I need to confess my sins? I mean, I know I'm not perfect. You know, isn't that another line that we always are throwing out there? I know I'm not perfect. 
as if, you know, you just gave a stark revelation to anybody. <laughs> they kind of already know. So, you know, but we, you know, we feel noble and saying, I know I'm not perfect. But we, you know, that's never a surprise. Never a surprise. So, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I know. So, I'll be okay. But if we start practicing repenting, we're going to start looking at this whole thing a whole lot differently. We won't be believing it anymore. And if we don't believe this, we're not going to do what is being done over here. We'll be over here and we'll be practicing repenting. Again, I I want us to get this as as much as we can this morning. because we're all, we're, I mean, we're, we just, this is just a part of who we are as people. It, it just, it's everywhere. It's in our churches, it's in the movies, it's in our conversations. We just think that somehow, you know, ah, uh, he was a good person. He'd give the shirt off of his back. She was a wonderful, wonderful lady. She baked cookies all the time. Again, not against any of that, but it's not salvation. It's not the core teaching of the Bible. You're not going to get a father, yes, a Jesus, yes, and the Holy Spirit, yes, over here. And so at times, even if we start believing this and start doing, uh, according to that, that practicing repenting, we're going to slip back over here, but here's the deal. This happens to me all the time. I believe it, it will also happen to you. We will know and we will catch ourselves going, uh, I slipped back into the old way of believing and the old th- way of thinking and doing. And now, by the wonder of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father saying yes, I'm repenting. I'm repenting of thinking bad thoughts about that. I'm repenting of thinking bad thoughts about those people. I'm repenting about even thinking bad thoughts about me. And when we practice this repenting and they are all focused on Jesus, they're focused on Jesus, they're focused on Jesus in the warmth. This is the kind of pile driving effect I'm hoping and praying that we as people can um, start receiving. Again, the pile driving teaching of the Bible from beginning in the Garden of Eden as we looked at, it's in the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, all the way to the end, the promises that are in the book of Revelation. From beginning to end is salvation only, always, forever in Jesus. The pile-driving teaching of the Bible from beginning to end is salvation only, always, forever in Jesus. And when we realize that, when we start believing that and we start practicing and and, and following that, we're going to hear the Father saying yes. We're going to hear Jesus saying yes. We're going to hear the Holy Spirit saying yes. We're going to get a whole lot more warmth out of the Bible because of we are believing that this is the core teaching of the Bible. Now, I'm hoping that this is something that is uh, helpful to us this morning. I'm also hoping that maybe it's a little bit um, challenging uh, because this is a, uh, it's messing with some of our, really our, our core beliefs, our core behaviors. But I think even as I present this to you, and you know that you've lived over here a lot, even in church, even with Jesus, even with singing the kind of songs that we sing, even with the teaching that we do over and over again, um, you know that somehow there's not a lot of freedom and a lot of warmth, really true, deep down core warmth there, right? And do you feel that? But do you sense a, just a wonder and a hope over here? Do do you, do you, do you realize that if you start practicing repenting, and if we start helping each other practicing repenting, not telling someone, you know, hey, you're a sinner, you need to repent, but if we just encourage them to, you know, if you, what do you, th- Jesus, 
What if you thought more about Jesus? What if you thought more about what Jesus wants for you? So that's going to be what we want to get after as we go through uh, the Apostles' Creed. And what I want us to do is, um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, why don't we stand and we're going to um, go confess our, our faith, the, this Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, faith, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. So if you wouldn't mind, let's uh, stand, because uh, I think these are always gr- great words to stand to as we think about the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So uh, let's confess, let's read these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So you may be seated. Uh, We'll have them bring up the lights a little bit so you can see what's on your uh, New Hope notes if you have those uh, available. Uh, We've got this broken up in what is uh, called the three, uh, three articles. And so the first article is about creation, about I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And what I want us to do in this Apostles' Creed series is connect these words that we know to the Bible. Again, sometimes we know things like, you know, what we just did with the Lord's Prayer series. We know the Lord's Prayer. We've said it over and over again in church, but have we connected it to the Bible? What does the Bible teach about the Father that we're saying, our Father? What's the Bible teaching about the kingdom when we say, the kingdom come? Um, and, and we say it at the end, the, the kingdom is, is coming. What's the, Bible te- what's the Bible teach about forget? What's the Bible teach about daily bread? All those things are in the essence, in the core of the Lord's Prayer. So the same kind of, so you get to see, uh, as I put on our notes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Genesis 17.1, um, or I, uh, that he's the maker of heaven and earth. Turn to Exodus 20, verse 11. It's going to say those exact kind of phrases there. And those, that's just a couple of the Bible passages, and we'll be putting a number of other Bible passages uh, together with this. And then this is what comes out of what we know as Luther's small catechism. If you're Lutheran, you know what that's about. If you're not Lutheran, don't worry about it. But there's just a treasure there that I want us to... Uh, dive into. Um, I, don't, I could care less that it's Luther's small catechism. These are just true words. So in the catechism, it takes what, is it, what else does this? What else does this mean? In in twelve words, in this first article, we're talking about the everlasting, eternal God, this Father who says yes, the Father who gives us the core teaching that our salvation uh, is here in the Bible, and it's in uh, Jesus. Who is this Father? So even with, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 words, I haven't counted them from the catechism, it's still not going to cover the wonders. We will never stop being amazed and caught up in thinking about the majesty and the wonders and the mystery of the, of the Father. So what else does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures that he has given me, my body and soul, eyes, ears, all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. That might sound like, um, give us this day our daily bread, kind of the connection there. He defends me against all danger and guards, protects me from all evil, delivers us from evil as Jesus teaches us to pray, kind of connection there. And then this, I love these words. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. Again, if I really am, am honest, ah, 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 but yet the Father wants to say yes, yes, yes to us. And for all this, for all this, my response that he leads me to practicing and repenting, that he leads me to the warm presence of Jesus. For all of this, this is the desire of the Father. This is the Father saying yes. For all of this is my duty to thank and praise, to serve and obey him, to have some good behaviors, not to save myself, but because of the Father. And then this great, great uh, summary statement. This, these are powerful words. Um, this is most certainly true. 
We read at the end of this explanation to the first article. Maybe we could even say that sentence together. This is most certainly true. And then with the second article, with, with the, the, the idea of redemption, we're talking about Jesus. And what you see in the second article, again, more than 12 words, but yet still not a lot of words when it comes to Jesus. But what you see in these words is, here's this sweep. Jesus is in heaven. He's going to come down to this earth. He's going to descend into hell. And we'll get into that in a few weeks because that's oftentimes the thing. What? what? You know? But then he, has, he, he rises. He's going to ascend back to the heaven. Then he's coming again. He's coming in. So in just these few words, we read, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. You can read that in Isaiah 7, the prophecy there. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and is buried. He descended into hell. We'll look at that, that's, that's where, where they get that phrase is from 1 Peter 3, 19. The third day, what he, he rose again from the dead, what we were uh, celebrating on Easter Sunday, what we're celebrating on this uh, Easter Sunday, and all the Easter Sundays that we get in a year. Um, and then he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. From thence he's going to come to judge the living and the dead. You can look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Again, from the catechism, we read these words. What does this mean? I believe... I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, those are, are all core teachings of the Bible, he's born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, again, here's this, that, that me with the, the sin, um, and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. And let's say it again. This is most certainly true. It's a story that we just <laughs> we're think, we're, this, this is Jesus. We know we're no longer in the Garden of Eden. We know we live in an amazing world with all kinds of gardens. We're going to live many, 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 many years, but we all know. But yet, because of Jesus rising from the tomb in that Easter garden, life is ours. That's our Jesus. And then we get to the third article. It's about this idea of sanctification. The Holy Spirit is making us holy. As our hearts and our minds are maybe stirred from this teaching this morning, I want you to be aware that's the Holy Spirit working in you. That's not your cleverness of being able to think and being able to wrestle with these big ideas. But there's something about the Holy Spirit that's moving in you. The Holy Spirit wanting you to realize that this is not the core teaching of the Bible. The Holy Spirit wanting you to realize that this is what you want to practice. So we uh, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then it looks like it jumps, like, um, okay, we're, we're, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But then it talks about the, uh, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Put uh, Bible verses with all those, those uh, phrases um, there too. Um, but yeah, we're going to see that wherever a holy church Christian churches, the Holy Spirit's active there, wherever the communion of saints, the Holy Spirit, the, the forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit's involved with that, the resurrection of the body, the, Holy, the life everlasting, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the what does this mean? These words may have had the most profound effect, and they're not Bible words, but yet they teach such the, the core of the Bible. That over the years, as I've considered these words and taught these words and thought about these words and prayed over these words and repeat these words, um, there's just something that gets a hold of me, and I hope that it will start getting a hold of you too. So what does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in this one true faith. In the same way he calls, he gathers, he enlightens, he sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, not just this church, but all kinds of churches, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in this one true faith. In this Christian church with a capital C, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. And once again we say, this is most certainly true. What we have just read is what we are teaching here. The Holy Spirit is the one helping us to be practicing repenting, practicing repenting in, in many ways. We probably won't ever get really, really good at it in ourselves. But whenever we're moved towards it, whenever we get caught over here and we are reminded that we need to be over here, it's the Holy Spirit. 
It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. This is most certainly true. I've changed the title to next week's message here on the bottom of your notes here um, to Holy Spirit, yes. We're going to, again, back our way through the Apostles' Creed. We're going to look at the Holy Spirit and his, his work over the next couple of weeks, and we'll deal some more with uh, Jesus. We're always dealing with Jesus, and then we'll end our series with looking at the, the, the Father. So that's the, the plan. Again, I hope this teaching is, is helpful, and um, let's stand and pray. Uh, Father, we want to hear your yes. Jesus, we want to hear your yes. Holy Spirit, we want to hear your yes. Help us to realize that even though we have been uh, maybe believing wrong for years and we've had great, great help in believing wrong and practicing wrong and... um, that you are a God of mercy and grace and you want to stir something new in us. You want to renew something in us that uh, for those of us that maybe have already been practicing repenting. So Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, help us to hear your yes. Help us to be moved over and over again towards you and towards the core teaching of the Bible and according to the truth of our salvation. Jesus' eternity is depending on this. So again, even though sometimes we realize that millions and millions and millions believe the wrong thing and practice the wrong thing, your Bible is even stronger than all those millions together. I want to praise you and I want us to help help each other to realize that there are millions and millions and millions that by the power of the Holy Spirit's yes, by the power of Jesus' yes, by the power of the Father's yes, that we believe and we practice the core teaching of the Bible. So help us as a church to do that. We ask and pray these things, Jesus, in your name. And again, keep helping us to pray the Lord's Prayer as we are learning it from the Bible. All these words that we know that are all connected to the Bible. So again, help us to tease these words out more and more so it might do a higher good for our souls. We ask and pray these things, Jesus. And so help us to pray. Let's join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.